Good morning. Morning. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, for sending Scott the email. I hope he got it. He didn't, didn't reply, so. Yeah, I hope he did too. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to make sure everything is set up right so that everybody can do what they need to do. <laughs> So Jen, how did you set up your headshot to come up if your video wasn't enabled? I've seen um, people so do that. I, when you go to zoom.com, you have like my account. Um, even if you don't have a paid account, there's like uh, user preferences. You can right. just add a picture from your computer there. So okay. I found the best one that was just my face that I have because I don't have any professional headshots. <laughs> Right. No, I was I was looking through the settings. I guess the Zoom app doesn't really have that option. So I oh, guess yeah. Go, go online and yeah, my account to do that. Yeah, I find it a lot easier to do things online when I'm trying to set up stuff in here. The app doesn't seem to do everything that the web website can do. I'm going to start sharing my screen so we have a welcome up.
Okay, good morning. Um, we're going to get started in a few minutes. Uh, but we've noticed that there was an issue with the links being shared. Um, and a lot of people are showing up on the participant list as Eric Anderson. Um, if you could um, to to help us moderate uh, this session, um, if you go to the participants link and then use the rename function to change your name. If your name appears as Eric Anderson, please uh, use the rename function to uh, uh, put in your, your actual name. That'll help us when we're going through the list and, and moderating the discussion and need to uh, mute and unmute folks uh, so that they can participate. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Andy Meyer. I'm the program chair with the city's Cincinnati section of APA Ohio, and also a senior planner at OKI Regional Council of Governments. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning as we delve into this new thing that is virtual public meetings. And uh, in kind of an ironic twist uh, this morning, uh, we do have a, um, a, a little uh, snafu uh, happening um, where a lot of those uh, attending the meeting are entering um, uh, named uh, under the name of Chris Anderson. Uh, so it's making it hard to kind of see who's who and later when we get into uh, the discussion, um, kind of makes, makes it hard to, to um, pick out folks um, to share their experiences. If you can, um, there is a way that you can um, uh, change your name. If you click on your uh, video feed in the right-hand corner, and if, if it says Eric Anderson and you are not Eric Anderson, uh, you can can um, select uh, 
believe there's a a way to um, do a rename function. I see several people who have come in as Chris Anderson and have uh, changed their name. Um, there is a, a way to do that um, by clicking on on your name in the list. So if you can do that, that would help us out uh, greatly. Um, but we'll proceed ahead. Um, so again, thank you for, for joining us this morning. Um, we've endured a lot of changes over the past eight weeks. We've adapted to new ways of doing things, uh, leveraging technology to allow us to continue to work and communicate. And, and lots of us have taken on uh, new and different roles, both at the job and, and at home. Um, one of the key ways that communities and public organizations have had to adapt is by continuing to hold public meetings and hearings a as required, um, while also complying with uh, uh, orders for social distancing and, and banning uh, public gatherings. Uh, many, and it's probably safe to say, uh, most uh, communities have turned to hosting virtual public meetings online and using one of the many uh, web conferencing platforms available. So at this point, we thought it'd be a good idea to get together and share our experiences, both the good and the bad, with this new way of conducting meetings. Um, really at this point, there's no list of best practices. No one's the expert. We're all kind of learning all of this on the fly um, together. Uh, so um, we're all new to conducting virtual public meetings and using video conferencing platforms in this way. And we need to learn from each other. These are, uh, there are quite a number of folks attending the session, both from Ohio and, and beyond. Um, we want to give as many of you a chance um, as we can, as many of you as we can, the chance to share your initial experience with uh, hosting public, virtual public meetings um, with the group. Uh, so this morning's agenda, we're, we're going to start off with Scott Phillips, a partner with Frost Brown Todd Law Firm in Cincinnati, and he'll give us a quick rundown of the current legal requirements of virtual public meetings and hearings in the state of Ohio. Uh, and then we'll follow that with a panel um, in leading off, uh, and they'll lead off in sharing their experiences with uh, virtual public meetings. On the panel, we have uh, Catherine Kehoe Jers, Planning Director with the City of Cincinnati. And Catherine um, actually brought up the idea for this session a couple weeks ago at our uh, APA Cincinnati board meeting. Um, and so it's, it's great that we're able to, to meet in this way. Um, also, we have Todd Kinski, Planning Director with the City of Dayton. Jeff Mills, Township Administrator with Coleraine Township, and Steve Johns, Planning Services Administrator with Hamilton County Planning and Development. And following this panel, uh, we hope we have plenty of time left to continue hearing from as many of you as possible. Uh, we, uh, we want you to share your experiences um, to do this, there's a uh, raise hand function um, down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, just click on that and uh, we'll be able to go down the list in turn and um, allow as many as we can to share their experiences with virtual public meetings. Um, before I get started, I need to acknowledge the efforts of a few people in helping bring this together. Uh, thanks to Eric Anderson, uh, director of the Cincinnati section of APA Ohio, uh, for getting the word out about this session. Uh, to Christine Dursey Davis, executive director of APA Ohio, for working so quickly to get registration up and running for the session. 
and Jen Spreckelmeyer with OKI who handled the logistics of setting up the online meeting today. Uh, with that, uh, it's time for me to step out of the way. And now we have Scott Phillips, uh, partner with Frostbound Todd. Um, Scott's practice is, okay, screen's not advancing. Um, Scott is partner with Frost Brown Todd, and he is, his practice is focused in land use and, and helping communities with, you know, am I sharing my screen? Sorry, I'm trying to do several things at once now. All right, there we go. Not, never, uh, never a dull moment. <laughs> so uh, Scott's practice is focused on land use and he advises numerous communities in the greater Cincinnati area on planning, zoning, and conducting public meetings. Uh, Scott's here to give us a quick rundown of the current legal requirements of public meetings and hearings in the state of Ohio and kind of set us up with the rules of the road. So take it away, Scott. Okay, I'm going to try to get Scott's phone number up. Unmute me. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Hello. Great. Thank goodness. Wow, that was brutal. Um, yeah, so I can see you guys. Uh, I just can't hear you, nor can you hear me from the screen. So I'm doing it on my uh, phone. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and run us through this. PowerPoint uh, very quickly. Andy, how much time approximately do I have for this? Can't hear you. Hello? Hey, Lois, can you hear me? Can you put a thumbs up if you can hear me? Thank you. Um, All right. Scott, uh, about 10 minutes. Hi, Lois. Okay, sure. No problem. Okay, so obviously everyone understands that there's an Open Meetings Act in Ohio, which basically governs um, how public bodies operate. Um, you know, the basics are if you have a meeting um, with more than a, um, a majority of the office holders, that meeting has to be done in public. The public has to have access to that meeting. The, um, the, um, the um, the public has to be able to be there along with the elected uh, officials, um, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, when the pandemic hit, when the state of emergency was put in place, the Ohio Attorney General, um, David Yost, basically said, well, given these new rules that you can only have, at first it was 50 people in close proximity, proximity now it's 10. Um, you know, you can't have a public meeting, so therefore the uh, Dr. Atkins, um, you know, pandemic uh, order trumps that of the open meeting uh uh, laws, which was problematic because there's nothing in the statute that says that. And on top of that, there was an official AG opinion that came out uh, about 10 years ago during um, uh, the swine flu pandemic that in essence said the exact opposite of that. So uh, we were very concerned about what that meant. Um, the first thing that we told our clients uh, was, cancel meetings. Um, let's not put ourselves in harm way because when this whole thing is over, it's very possible that um, uh, some opportunistic lawyers that like to run around and sue governmental entities for violating um, Sunshine Law, Open Meetings Act, Public Records Act will have a field day. And obviously for our public clients, you know, we're concerned about uh, adverse publicity. We're concerned about um, the, the monetary uh, damages that have to be paid. But most importantly, we're concerned about attorney's fees, both in defending as well as having to pay the other side. So uh, what we said was, let's like kind of like bear down. Uh, I was actually on a conference call <clears throat> with other law directors and solicitors with the AG shortly after that. Um, he never admitted that he made a mistake, but he did um, say that uh, they would provide some clarification, which you know really wasn't very helpful when we got his clarification because it basically said, yeah, just every entity needs to do what they think's best. Thankfully, the legislature stepped in and passed a, um, a, a um, an emergency statute that basically, in essence, says um, that for, because of this um, act, uh, pandemic, um, the uh, some of the rules that affect um, virtual meetings are being suspended during the pendency of the crisis or until uh, December of 2020. So. That then provided us with um, a certain level of comfort, which um, in moving forward with public meetings. Um, what we're going to cover here in the next seven minutes is what that statute provides for and how you can do this. So, in essence, you can use Zoom, you can use Teams, you can use Snapchat if you want to use that, you can use conference calls. Whatever you want to do, um, the public officials do not have to be together, um, but they can be. And you could have a meeting in which all public officials are present, but the public is not allowed to be in the room as long as the meeting is streamed to them uh, so that they can um, uh, at least listen. Um, obviously, I think most of you probably know there is not a requirement for public participation in meetings unless there's a public hearing taking place on a zoning case or something else. So you could, in essence, have a public meeting without having any participa participation. Um, just like Andy had us all muted, you could mute uh, the call uh, during that period of time uh, for the public and uh, as long as the public is able to hear. One of the things that we were concerned about is what happens if you have a Zoom meeting, but uh, because of antiquated uh, computers by the public or lack of uh, streaming ability because kids and spouses and everybody else is using the internet, they can't really access it. One of the things we recommended if you're doing a Zoom, a Zoom call, which seems to be the one that's most popular right now, is to also provide a call-in number separate from Zoom 
so that people could, uh, who don't have access to either Wi-Fi um, or sufficient Wi-Fi to stream or have access to a computer could at least call in and listen that way. Um, if, you know, you do a virtual meeting, uh, you do the same exact things. It's the same exact um, process as before. As a matter of fact, um, some of my clients that are doing are, are even doing the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, which is really awkward. I mean, because sometimes people are standing, some people are sitting. Uh, you know, you got to get the virtual flag up there. But uh, for the most part, it's operating just like a meeting um, normally would, although abbreviated. Um, you know, other than just being able to vote uh, virtually, to, to stream the meeting virtually, everything else stays the same. Um, notice, minutes, um, the same rules that apply to executive session uh, apply, and we'll talk about that in a minute as well. I think we covered this next slide. Um, when using audio, only tell, um, you know, one of the things that makes it a little tricky is if we're using um, just phones, making sure that everybody is um, is particip that uh, participates in the meetings, identifying themselves before they speak. Um, Public notice requirements is really about the same, except that when you, if you're doing a special meeting, uh, you have to give 24 hours advance notice of that meeting. And uh, in the meeting notice, um, you're required uh, to go ahead and to um, indicate how uh, the public can participate by either having a Zoom call um, or by uh, the telephone number, you provide that in the notice. Uh, the thing that I've seen that's worked the best so far, and I've participated in probably half a dozen of these um, over the last couple of weeks, is Zoom. Um, you have a moderator um, who would uh, function like Andy has in this meeting. That person um, allow, it basically has everyone muted except the, the panel, the panelists, the people that are um, the elected officials and potentially um, uh, potentially the uh, you know staff. Uh, when you get to public participation, if you're going to have that, then um, you have people indicate through the um, raised hand function on Zoom that they would like to speak, and uh, the moderator, the person that's controlling the the access then allows the person to uh, un unmute them, allows them to speak. We also, because not everyone understands the technology, will have at the end of that session um, uh, where the raised hands are is to uh, basically then open it up to basically say, I'm going to uh, unmute the meeting uh, so that if anyone has not spoken that, that um, otherwise wanted to, they can go ahead. Also, with the backup of the phone, uh, because you can't tell exactly who's calling, who's who, we do the same thing after that in terms of letting people, uh, we unmute all the, all the people that are participating by phone call and allow them uh, to speak um, as well and to make any of their, um, any of the points that they want to. Um, Emergency meetings, you have to give, uh, you know, as, as much notice as practical, practicable. It's just like the regular rules. Um, okay, so I think the meetings part of this is pretty simple. What gets pretty complicated and is pretty difficult to, um, to track is, uh, is the hearings. So um, what I've been advising my clients is if we can get apps applicants on any case that is either um, uh, controversial or complicated to, um, to continue so that we can reevaluate next month, um, that would be my preference. Because um, one of the things that, you know, with, for example, a BZA hearing, the, the BZA is the fact finder, which means that they're taking into account evidence as well as 
um, things such as credibility, which is judged through body language, tone, and all those type of things, which is extremely difficult to do through Zoom. So I get, I get somewhat concerned about what happens on appeal given um, how difficult it is to run a public hearing through this technology. And so uh, what we've done, I think, pretty successfully is with kind of routine type things that aren't that big of a deal that we're not going to have, you know, 10 people speak, you know, speaking against. Uh, we've done those and it's worked relatively well. I did have for one of my clients, a pretty controversial one that had 10 people. They kept going back and forth. They kept raising their hands. They kept getting unlocked. It was um, it was somewhat chaotic um, and difficult to really, I think, create um, a clean record from. Um, nevertheless, um, it had to happen because of some, some issues uh, with a contract on this particular property getting ready to expire. So they had to move forward uh, under their contract, but I can tell you it was, it was pretty difficult to do. And obviously, if you have a public hearing, uh, everyone has to be able to, to, to speak. Uh, we did suggest uh, people try to keep it to five minutes. Um, a lot of people went over that. And again, like I said, uh, they raised their hand multiple times. So it, it was just very difficult to kind of follow normal decorum uh, in that. But um, what I'm hoping is if one of these things is tough and there's uh, subsequent litigation, the courts will understand that uh, we were doing the best we can in, in a very difficult uh, situation. Um, executive sessions, really, um, the way we've been handling those is uh, we've been, uh, if we've been conducting a meeting via Zoom, um, we, uh, we leave Zoom uh, during the, the executive session and do that by phone call um, so that uh, we don't make a mistake and, and fail to um, uh, close someone out or something along those ways is what I've seen work the best. Um, I do know that there's the capability and the technology to go back and, in essence, um, you know, take people off the screen or, you know, mute, you know, mute them. But um, I, I'm nervous about, you know, having the same Zoom, uh, the same, um, the same uh, executive session uh, happen on the, you know, the same Zoom call. Um, I suppose you could do a separate Zoom call for executive session, but my, um, my suggestion would be to not try to do it on the same one, even though the technology says that you can do it. Um, so one of the things that is, is kind of one of my axioms of life is just because you can do it doesn't mean that you should do it. I think there was a little bit of the cool factor when all this started and I was finding some people wanting to use Zoom because it was cool um, and they wanted to use the technology, um, you know, for just routine public hearings, uh, or I'm sorry, routine public meetings without hearings. I think it works okay. I, I don't think it's great, but, you know, whatever. It allows us to continue to operate. Unfortunately, it, the same cannot be said as it relates to public hearings. Um, it is very, very difficult to do. Um, I know some people are using it and uh, seem to be doing okay. The ones that I've been involved in were ex at best uh, very awkward, uh, at worst, you know, somewhat problematic. So um, I, would, I would suggest um, uh, trying to avoid it unless it's uh, an extremely routine or um, uncomplicated case. And that's the presentation. Uh, are there any questions for Scott um, at this point? 
before we launch into our panel. We'll turn it over. We have um, on our panel, uh, Catherine keogh uh Planning Director with the City of Cincinnati, uh, Todd Kinski, Planning Director with the City of Dayton, Jeff Mills, uh, uh, Township Administrator with Coleraine Township, and Steve Johns, who's Development Services Administrator with Hamilton County Planning and Development. Um, so I'll call uh, each in turn, uh, starting with Catherine, to uh, share with us their experiences. Um, and uh, what we're looking to cover is, um, first, what conferencing platform have you used? Um, what has gone right? And, and perhaps what has gone wrong? Uh, and if you've made any adjustments to how you do things after those initial meetings, um, what adjustments have you made? So I'll turn it over uh, to Catherine first. Thanks, Andy. Hi, everyone. Um, I think the last time we all saw each other was um, at the David J. Aller Planning and Zoning Workshop, which seems to have been sort of the last day that everything was kind of normal around here. Um, everything kind of started happening very quickly that next week. And, um, you know, it went from, well, this might be a problem to, okay, everybody's going to stay at home and work from home now um, in a very short period of time. And so, of course, much like the rest of you, I think that we kind of um, started out with this thinking, well, it might not be too long. Maybe this is just going to be a couple of weeks. It won't be a problem. We canceled a planning commission meeting that was already scheduled. So, um, uh, you know, we thought, well, maybe we'll just delay things a little bit. Well, you know, now we're, we're really looking at this as something that it is kind of a new way of life for us all to, to, to look at. So um, much like yourselves, I think that we're, you know, really looking at this as um, how do we incorporate um, the need to stay socially distant and keep people safe um, while um, at the same time ensuring that there is um, a fair process uh, for applicants, uh, a fair opportunity for um, impacted property owners and state other stakeholders and community representatives to participate and um, and how do we do that all equitably so um, we have really sort of thought through um, thought through it I would say a little bit at a time I wouldn't say that we um, started out with sort of a grand plan of how we're going to do this um, but we at the city of Cincinnati have sort of taken it one step at a time and and that first step was to hold our city planning commission meetings virtually um, and, and we used Zoom um, as, as the platform and, and it was sort of a hybrid. Um, so some people are in the room and some people are dialing in um, with no opportunity for the public to participate. So the public is not invited to attend. If they want to comment on anything, they need to send it via email a certain amount of time uh, you know, ahead of the meeting. Um, but I will say that I think our city cable does a great job um, in making sure that um, uh, you know, people are able to see uh, to see the meeting. And if you actually watch it on city cable, it, it really does, uh, they really do it in a way that's quite seamless. Um, where, it, you, you know, if you're watching a city cable, it's, it, they, they really, they do a good job of focusing on whoever's speaking, whether it's um, someone who is live in the meeting or someone who is dialing in um, virtually or by phone. Um, uh, so, you know, moving on then to, to city planning commission, we um, made a couple of changes in the way that we did city planning commission. We worked really closely with our law department to uh, make sure that we were, uh, you know, as Scott said, doing our noticing correctly, um, using the correct language in our noticing to make sure that people understood the situation um, and understood how we were, how we were kind of planning to proceed with, with a city planning commission meeting. We changed the location of our city planning commission. We typically meet uh, in Centennial 2, uh, which is the building where city, the Department of City Planning is located. We actually moved our meetings to City Hall to council chambers um, where um, uh, people were able to spread out a little bit more um, and where City Cable is a little bit more able to, to, to broadcast. So we, um, we also held sort of a, a hybrid meeting where uh, the chair uh, and one other commission member was uh, live in, in City Council Chambers along with a couple of members of city staff. 
and then the rest of the um, uh, the rest of the the commission members joined via Zoom. And uh, yes, we did have you know one person who was sort of managing the Zoom account and um, being kind of the 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 um, the Zoom czar. And um, but we in that meeting did not uh, did not allow any any public uh, engagement. Um, we did ask people to send us send us um, uh, emails 48 hours prior to to the meeting. So uh, you know that was a couple of weeks ago, and we're we're starting to see that this is lasting a little bit longer, and we're hearing that maybe we need to sort of think about how we how we do this for maybe even the next 18 to 24 months. So we've had to evolve further, um, and now we are you know we're embarking upon bringing the public into the meetings via Zoom. Um, our, our law department who ho holds the um, zoning hearing uh, zoning hearings uh, with the zoning hearing examiner had their first um, zoning hearings yesterday um, where uh, applicants were able to appear via via zoom and um, uh, as were um, uh, interested parties and those went really well um, next week we're going to be holding our first staff conferences public staff conferences which are a part of the zone change process um, uh, that are that are really primarily public meetings. Um, so uh, we're gonna be holding ours, th those of ours uh, for the, the first time next week. And then in two weeks, two weeks from today, we'll be holding another city planning commission meeting where we do have several quasi judicial items. So they do require public hearings and we will be allowing people uh, to, to join in. I think um, the important thing to note that we're doing um, is that we are making people let us know that they are going to participate in the hearing ahead of time. We're not just putting a Zoom link out there for anyone to look at, uh, for anyone to join in at any time. Um, we wanna be able to control it a little bit and to see, um, to be prepared, um, I think more, uh, more than anything, to know how many people we can expect and um, then, then those people who pre-register will get a Zoom link so that we can kind of understand a little bit more about, you know, what we're really looking at. Um, just to, I know, I don't wanna, I, we could all probably, all four of us could talk probably for hours on this. So I'm just gonna, you know, wrap it up by saying that one of the things that we're looking at now um, is we're, we're looking at, oh, and uh, I do wanna say also that um, one thing that was really helpful in, in our um, city planning commission meeting is that we put together a script for our, um, for our chair. Um, just because it is a little bit of a different kind of platform, obviously, for for us, and it, it it's so different because in a live meeting you um, you can read people's facial expressions, you know, and you can kind of read body language, and you can see who wants to talk, and you can see who looks confused, and it makes it a little bit easier, and you can see people in the audience getting restless. You can't do that um, when when you're when you're on this kind of virtual platform. So we put together a a, a a script for our for our chair and I think that was really helpful and I think that we're going to continue to do that just to make sure that we that we pause at certain points to see if anyone has any questions to make sure that the people who are zooming in are um, are uh, uh, doing okay and see if they have any questions or um, any comments um, but finally I just want to sort of finish off by saying that we are really looking um, at sort of a more kind of holistic um, community engagement policy um, if this is something that's going to become a part of our lives, how do we do this and how do we do this in a way that is fair and equitable for everyone? Uh, so uh, I tried to talk really fast. Uh, <laughs> let's turn it over to the next panelist. Okay, that didn't work. Uh, next we have uh, Todd Kinski. Um, Todd, yeah. Hey everyone. So. Um, <clears throat> I'll see if I can be more brief than Catherine. I'll try to beat her. Um, <clears throat> so we have four boards of commissions that we manage in my office here, um, and we're all, we we've used Zoom for all of them. It um, by and large has gone pretty well. I will echo <clears throat> what Scott said earlier. We haven't had one of those nasty public hearings yet, and. Um, Things for the most part have been pretty straightforward. <clears throat> so we're a little worried about the, how that's gonna go and we've been giving that a lot of thought. Um, I'd say, um, you know, I would just echo Catherine's comment about, it's really important to make people contact you. So you send out the notices and then they, they have to reach out to you. So you send them the, the URL, the phone number for them to be able to get access. I think that, you know, I think we just have heard some worse, worse stories about 
these uh, Zoom bomb meetings and people doing things they shouldn't do. And we just want to make sure that, you know, they have some standing. Um, anyway, um, I'd say the things that have gone wrong, um, I'd just say two things. One, um, one of our chair people um, has had, he's got a bad connection at his house. And so um, he's leading it and sometimes he's breaking up. And I feel like um, the advice is that you have to empower your vice chair to speak up and say, hey, <laughs> can't hear you. Someone's got to take over. Um, so to me, that's been a challenge. And we've had to kind of talk to our chair person about, hey, is there a stronger wife? I say, no, can you tell your wife to get off the, the not watch a movie while you're on here or something? Because it's really important. Um, the other thing is that we have, we have two pretty elderly members who are uh, you know, volunteers who serve on our boards who just, are, just have no technical savviness at all. And this has been real hard for them because, you know, even when we're trying to do training with people remotely, we're not going to send someone to their house and train them. You know, that's the whole point here is to be separate. And so that's been a challenge. Um, and there's not a real good answer except for having them call in, which, you know, it's just a whole different experience when you're on the phone. You can't see the screen, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, I'd say that's kind of where we are. I'd say I would just echo also what Catherine is saying is that, you know, we're really trying to think about community engagement uh, beyond our required public hearings and board meetings. Um, you know, as planners, you know, we're all about engaging people in the planning process. And what does that look like? You know, so um, I think it's really incumbent on us as a profession uh, to really be thinking about that beyond um, just the public hearing realm. So we, I, we, we've got a small group of my, in my office up here have been tasked with kind of creating a white paper around best practices because um, we're trying to figure it out. And especially in a city like Dayton where we have a, we really have a digital divide and we have a lot of uh, disadvantaged folks who uh, either don't have Wi-Fi or, or don't have the devices that they need. So anyway, um, that's all I got. Happy to answer questions. Great, thanks, Todd. Um, next up, we have Jeff Mills with Coleraine Township. Hey, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep, excellent, all right, thanks. It's good to see everybody. Um, yeah, so Coleraine Township, uh, our Zoning Commission and, and Board of Zoning Appeals has been postponed in April and May. Um, I have a, a, a strong suspicion that we'll be back at it in June because we have some really important projects that need to get moving. Um, our board of trustees and our record commission and our uh, JED boards, they have all met online uh, using Zoom and um, we, we have not conducted a, a public hearing yet. Uh, these have all just been public meetings and, and they fall right in line with what you've heard from, from Catherine and Todd. We're, we're getting uh, communications inbound uh, via email and then we're reading them into the record and that's been um, uh, uh, pr particularly interesting when when the uh, when the comments are very critical <laughs> of what you're trying to do and you're having to voice those yourself. It's it's a really odd sort of dichotomy that that comes into your mind at that moment. But um, that is what's going on. Um, we have you know folks on site, folks off site, um, and and frankly, I've been very surprised at how smoothly it's gone. Um, we've been relying heavily on our partnership with Waycross Community Media, so they are. Uh, live uh, on cable and then recorded for folks to see um, uh, at a later date. Um, one of the things I think that is has been really interesting uh, that that our, um, our 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 planning shop has done a, a fantastic job of. Mike Iona, our planning director, and Jesse Urbancic in particular, have been trying to figure out what does long range planning look like in a time you know in COVID time. You know, how do you do meaningful engagement in a way that you can create a comprehensive plan um, right now? And, and we've found some, some uh, pretty, uh, I don't know, unintended consequences perhaps. Most recently, you know, one of the most, um, if you go to imaginecolrain.com, which is the website that, that Mike and Jesse have been working on, uh, you can see that, you know, we're starting to populate different ideas about, you know, where our community should be in the future. But we're seeing some very lewd and vulgar things that happen when you know we're all on the internet. You know, somehow um, there's you know the internet seems to bring out the sometimes the worst in us. And so there have been some very colorful language uh, calls for uh, strip clubs at prominent locations, and that 
because it's on the internet, it has bubbled to the top of the of the list, and it's just it's it's um it's an interesting study in in human psychology. But we're, what we're trying to figure out is is how 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 do you do that? How do you get meaningful meaningful feedback? And I think that uh, Mike and Jesse in particular have done a great job at at moving um, that conversation forward in Colerain. Um, in terms of lessons learned, as, as sort of final thoughts, um, when you're doing these meetings, uh, it's been very helpful for us to do trial runs beforehand. So, you know, a, a day before, everybody logs into the Zoom uh, link. They make sure that they've got the right Zoom link, where to call um, uh, if, if they have trouble. And that's, that's the other thing, is setting up a, a point person for uh, troubleshooting. So one person on the staff is the person to call, and they are the person that, you know, um, that sets, uh, you know, that, that walks you through the, the, the problems that you will inevitably encounter. But ultimately, the work must go on, right? The work of government and planning, it has, to, it has to continue. So these are the things that we need to figure out. Um, it's been so helpful to lean on all of you as we move through these really unexpected times. Anyway, that's all I had. Great, thanks, Jeff. Um, you know, I'm monitoring the questions as they're coming in. Um, I, I think we're going to hold those until the end. Um, so I'm going to ask Steve Johns uh, with Hamilton County to give us his take on um, his experience with public meetings. Thanks, Andy. So uh, one thing I love about this platform is I get to show off my bookshelf and show that it's much better than Todd's, uh, uh, clearly, you can see. And, and we know that sometimes these meetings, a dog or a cat might run in. So that kind of gives it a whole new flavor as well. So I, I like that uh, kind of uh, unknown aspect that, uh, that comes with this new form of technology. One thing that uh, I wanted to try to add with, to Scott's comments was the idea of the chat function. Uh, we've heard that the chat function is something you should turn off because that is a public record uh, that would come along with the, the meeting. So uh, that was a, a quick learning that we had that you don't want to actually have the chat function, which is kind of strange, right? You want people to be able to chime in with questions like we're doing here in this program offline while the speaker is still going. Um, but we've been advised that that's not a great idea because it, then it's all public record. And then uh, people have heard the horror stories of the uh, chat function where someone uh, is doing a one-to-one -one chat and uh, th that actually gets recorded to the administrator of the Zoom call. And so then you see something that you thought was private uh, during the call is now part of the record. So uh, be careful for that. Uh, training has come up. That's something that's huge. Uh, I talked a little about in our prep call for this uh, uh, Zoom that um, just reaching out to your communications team is really helpful. Uh, that this is not just a planning uh, problem. This is a problem for your, your councils, uh, other meetings that are trying to happen. And we have some communication experts. I know at the county we definitely have. Uh, I've run into the ICRC folks that uh, were real helpful and had, had a lot of experience with this. And so we're able to advise folks on what to do. Um, I think one of the big things too is that as soon as you think you've got it, got this technology down, then something weird happens. Uh, so yesterday um, we had Regional Planning Commission and we had done the training for our Regional Planning Commission back in April and it seemed like everyone had gotten it and uh, figured it out. And then we had a commissioner come in via their iPad, but they couldn't get their audio to work. Uh, so we could see them and they're going like, what's going on, you know, all this. And, uh, and so then I end up calling them on my cell phone and then having them be online uh, via my Zoom at, uh, with a speaker phone on my speaker, you know, a, a conference call happening uh, on the speaker phone. So really weird things happening. And then you get the echo effect going on there. And then 15 minutes into the meeting, somehow the iPad works for it. So, um, it's really strange, uh, the kind of things that we're seeing happen. Um, I think uh, we've emphasized it a little bit, having your, your chair act like this is a regular meeting, you know, to have the chair authority. I was laughing, what is the gavel on Zoom, right? It, there's gotta be a new way to have a, 
a gavel uh, click icon, right? That you can say, hey, I'm in charge here. Everyone be quiet. Uh, let's get back to decorum. So uh, I think some of those just old fashioned techniques uh, of having a strong chair uh, really take control of the meeting is something that's uh, very important. And I'll leave it at that and maybe we can get to some questions. All right, thanks, Steve. Yeah, we've had a couple of uh, questions and points um, specifically regarding BZA meetings. Um, a, a question about how, how does um, the need to submit evidence work? So a lot of times um, participants in a BZA meeting will bring in photographs or different exhibits to uh, show to the board and, and doing that in a virtual format presents a, a new um, set of technological challenges, um, especially if it's a member of the public who isn't as technically savvy with um, the, the online platform. Um, and then Scott Phillips had a, a chime in um, regarding if there is technical difficulties during a hearing such as a BZA meeting um, with one of the um, the commission BZA commission members, um, you know what needs to happen as as far as um, them missing part of the meeting. So why don't uh, one any of our panelists if they have uh, thoughts to chime in on on those two points? Well, I'll, I'll just say that. Um, I haven't been to our BZA meeting yet, but uh, on the idea of having exhibits and things like that, um, this hybrid approach seems to have possibilities. Uh, so we're still having staff give the staff presentation at our regular regional planning commission office. So there is some opportunity for someone from the public or uh, an attorney or somebody to actually attend to that space and still manage six foot social distancing and be able to show things, uh, even if it is a poster board, um, at that locale. So that's a possibility. We've, we've held a couple of BZA meetings already. Um, and in fact, one of the things I was gonna mention that I forgot earlier is that our upcoming uh, schedule of meeting um, cases is so big that we split into two meeting dates because, you know, I mean, six cases that could last an hour each. No one has that, you know, stamina to be on here for six hours. So we split into two meetings, which is really something we wouldn't have thought of probably doing uh, if it was, you know, in person. Um, but in terms of BZA, you know, uh, I think with attorneys and, um, you know, you can share your screen. And so you can submit your evidence um, on the screen and it's being recorded. I suppose you could also submit things in advance. Um, you know, we've been asking, all, reaching out and trying to be a little bit more um, communicative with our, uh, all of our applicants and saying, what do you need? Do you, are you going to have a presentation? Or you have things we need to see? And so we're just doing a little bit more staff work up front to get everything. Um, and um, we haven't had a real tough one yet. So we haven't had to deal with the whole cross-examination yet. We have been giving it some thought. Uh, but, you know, I think the my, my, my request here is that when someone deals with it and they figure it out, can you please share it with us <laughs> so we can all know how to do this? Yeah, I think that's the point of trying to share these experiences is to get at, you know, who's figured it out or what have we figured out and piece together a set of best practices, um, you know, and I'll, I'll point out um, in the case that um, Scott Phillips brought up um, via the, the chat uh, was a, a member of the BZA, their, their internet went out for a, a number of minutes during the meeting. And really the, the direction or solution there was that that member then he had to abstain from voting on the case because they weren't present um, for all of the 
um, presentation and, and hearing of witnesses. Um, so it, it does create some, some limitations. Um, I've also seen a, a few questions come through about, um, you know, as we're looking that, that the social distancing and inability to gather could extend for another um, 18 months or, or so. Um, how do we do um, planning work and, and gather public input on long range planning uh, issues? And, and obviously, you know, kind of, um, we do use virtual ways now of, of gathering public input via um, surveys and, and things like that. Um, but has anybody given any thought to how to do more um, personal um, uh, gathering public input, especially on on um, on something as comp complex as a a land use plan map or something like that. Andy, if I can just sort of chime in first on this one, I think this is something we're all just going to have to figure out as we go. I mean, I think that um, you know we're we're all we're all asking that question, and I, and I saw Leah Holstein, you're the one who asked the question. Leah, I think, and everyone, we're going to have to kind of continue to ask ourselves that question and think through um, what does it look like today. You know, how do we incorporate um, you know ways to keep people safe and keep things equitable into how we do things today. And I think that we, you know, as planners, it's incumbent upon us to, you know, think of some of these things ourselves, but then also figure out ways to engage the community to talk about how to engage them. I know that that sounds kind of, kind of crazy, but um, I, I think that we need to let the community help us decide how that works. And it might work differently for different communities. And we need to think about places where there may not be much of a digital divide. Everybody has access to the internet. Everybody has computers. Everybody has webcams. Everybody's really familiar with it. There may be other communities where they, they don't even have internet access. They might not have a computer in their house. How do we do that? How do we do that in a way that um, you know, keeps, keeps people safe um, but also some of those folks who are, um, you know, who may not have, um, who may not have access to a computer or, or the internet are some of the ones who are most negatively impacted um, by some of the work that, you know, that, that we might be talking about. So, you know, it, it is, it's a big, um, it, it, it's really a big thing to look at. Um, and I think that we have to give ourselves some grace as we do this. Um, whatever we come up with first isn't going to be perfect. We have to realize that it's going to evolve over time. And we kind of, I think we need to sort of set that expectation too, that, that you know, we're, we're, we're going to try to do the best we can, but, but things might change. And if we need to change, we as professionals then need to sort of step back and, and have um, to say, uh, you know what, it's okay. It's okay that it didn't work out this way. It's okay to change. It's okay to try something new. Um, and I think that's gonna be a little bit of a different, um, a different mindset for us because we all sort of think things need to work perfectly right from the beginning. Just as we're doing all of these virtual meetings, we're gonna to need to have a little bit of patience and grace with each other as people are figuring out how to work the mute button, how to dial in, how to make all of this work. So that's just sort of where I am with it right now. And it's something that our staff is really thinking through um, and, 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 you know, the, the policy document that we're kind of thinking through on this, we recognize is, is, is going to be a living document. It's going to change. Yeah, I, I'm real interested in the Zoom breakout room function. I have not really uh, used that too much. Um, actually, my wife tried to do a happy hour that way. Um, so, uh, but I think that has some good uh, possibilities for the planning aspect of, of a virtual meeting. Uh, kind of like the small group technique um, that has been used in a lot of uh, vision meetings and uh, you know, uh, trying to get people to be able to converse maybe on a particular topic uh, where there are four or five people in a separate room and then they come back to the larger room and, and maybe a leader then reports to the greater group. So I, I haven't experienced that yet, but I think there's some good possibilities there. Yeah, Steve, I, I agree with you. I think that the, the component of outreach that is going to be critical is moderate is is moderated um, uh, outreach. I think that the unmoderated sort of unfiltered social media world 
that produces unreliable and, and um, uh, it, it gives you feedback that is, I, I don't believe is representative of what the, the, tr the true community vibe is uh, because of, um, cause it sort of functions as an echo chamber. Um, so I think that the key, as you just pointed out, Steve, is, is to come up with ways to have moderated engagement um, in a way that, you know, doesn't make us sick, <laughs> you know, literally like make, give us coronavirus. And so, um, you know, I think, in fact, in Coleraine, we're going to be partnering with uh, Jeff Steck, hopefully, um, to do some moderated engagement um, and, 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 and sort of focus group kind of stuff. Um, using, uh, you know, Zoom and all the stuff that we're all using. So, but I would, I would, I, I just worry that we're all going to like rush to Facebook and say, you know, hey, Facebook, what should, what should be at the intersection of walk and don't walk over there? And, and they're all going to say, you know, a strip club and that's going to bubble up to the top as it did, <laughs> as it did in our experience. Uh, and that's, I don't believe representative of what the broader community really wants. Um, so anyway. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, we do have one hand raised. Um, uh, Andy Vodakovic um, with PDS. Um, and Jen, could you unmute him? Okay, looks like Andy's, Andy's live. Andy, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. So, uh, good morning to everyone. I just wanted to share uh, an experience we had. We had our first Planning Commission virtual meeting last night. And it was a real pitchfork and torch kind of meeting. We had over a hundred people attend our meeting. Um, I could go into a lot of the details, but in general, I agree with everybody want, said. I just have a few things I wanted to touch on. First of all, the, the chat box. So we actually left our chat box open only so we could address technical issues that people were having. Um, unfortunately, uh, with the way chat boxes are, it, it, it did uh, get used in ways that we didn't intend it to, which is unfortunate, but it really was not that big of a deal. And ultimately we were able to solve a lot of technical problems. Our secretary was able to reach out to people and help them out without disrupting the flow of the meeting. The other thing that I wanted to mention, um, well, about the chat, chat box too is we had to stay on top of it. So every time somebody wrote something every five minutes or something like that, we put up there that this chat box was not for public comment, that if they needed to register that this, these were the directions that they had to register. And then at the end of the meeting, we were advised to save a copy of that chat box for the record. Now it's not testimony that got passed along, but just so if anything legally happened down the line, that it was absolutely clear that people understood what the instructions were and, and that was not testimony that they were giving in that chat box. The other thing that I wanna say that we did is, and I think uh, Mr. Johns alluded to this, is we did have uh, bare bones uh, staff and commission actually in the office together. Um, we had the, the chair of the planning commission and the planning commission's attorney in a conference room um, that made the logistics of how the meeting was going and if anything happened a lot easier to handle um, between them. And then we had the staff presenter and then we had the, the meeting um, administrator also in the room. So we could, um, if something came up, we, we could communicate quickly with each other. We still maintained our distance and everything, but it just kept the, the movement of the meeting going a little bit, like I said, a little bit smoother. Also at the office, at least on the technology side, we knew we had, we had the, the good internet connection and all the technology available at the office. So I just wanted to share those couple experiences. There we go. Got my mute and unmute. Uh, so thanks. Um, It seems like, uh, you know, we'll have one more to share from the, from the comments. Um, and, and this is from Rachel Compte um, with uh, the city of Newport that um, they're working on running public input meeting um, held on Zoom, but streamed out through YouTube Live 
so it can't be over overtaken. So kind of that um, you have to, to reg pre-register to actually participate in the meeting, but then the broader meeting is, is streamed out live um, to anyone who, who wants to follow it. Um, so um, I think with that, and, and because we're, we're right at our time here, um, I want to thank all the participants, all of our panelists, um, this was very informative. I think it was helpful um, hearing everybody's different experiences and, um, and approaches to things. Um, you know, and, and it was in, in some ways cathartic as well, uh, just to be able to understand that um, everybody's having um, issues and, and, and hiccups related to this um, new technology and new, new format of doing things. Um, I think that we definitely um, should and, and will have a follow-up to this um, in a little while as things become more, more clear and, and we can kind of uncover some, some best practices to share with everyone. So thank you for attending. Um, and um, oh, I also want to mention the session was registered for CM credits. So if you are looking to get CM credits, um, you have well, the ability to claim one hour of uh, AICP CM credit for this. Um, thank you all for participating this morning. And I hope everyone has a great day and a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Bye.